Welcome back, everyone. We have just watched episode three of the four-part HBO documentary series, Alan vs. Farrow. I have no doubt that it elicits strong reactions and raises many questions. And I'm very pleased to introduce a distinguished panel of special guests to discuss those issues and take your questions. Please join me in welcoming Michaela Schwer, documentary filmmaker based in Los Angeles. Michaela is the editor, writer, and co-producer of Alan B. Farrow, which garnered seven primetime Emmy nominations, including two for Michaela for picture editing and writing. Thank you, Michaela, very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Thomas D. Lyon is the Judge Edward J. and Rui L. Guirado Chair in Law and Psychology at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. He teaches evidence and the child interviewing practicum. Lyon directs the USC Child Interviewing Lab, which conducts research and forensic interviews with children who've been victims of maltreatment or who have witnessed violence. Nationally recognized, his work is supported by many major foundations and institutions. He's a prolific author, presenter, and trainer in the field. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us, Tom. Thank you for having me. Harriet Kerr is the Director of Prevention and Community Education at UCLA's Rape Treatment Center in Santa Monica. She's been helping children and adults cope with the trauma of sexual assault for more than 20 years. Established in 1974, the Rape Treatment Center at UCLA Santa Monica Medical Center is internationally recognized for its pioneering work and exemplary treatment, prevention, and education programs. The center has also had a leadership role in advancing policy reforms, creating multi-agency partnerships, and developing innovative service delivery models. We look forward to hearing much from you tonight. Thank you so much for being with us, Harriet. Thank you very much. I just want to say that was um, my previous position. I was the director of prevention and community education, but I'm currently the director of Stewart House, our children's advocacy center. Um, and I'm also a trained forensic interviewer and I've conducted about 3000 interviews of children in child sexual abuse investigations. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Harriet, for the update. and. Um in all of the positions that you've fulfilled and the extraordinary experience you've garnered, make you a very valuable panelist tonight. Thank you so much. Let's welcome Jeff Todal. Dr. Todal is an associate professor and the director for the Couples and Family Therapy Program, Counseling, Psychology and Human Services Department of the College of Education at the University of Oregon, also the co-director and director of research at the Center for the Prevention of Abuse and Neglect a highly engaged and active practitioner in the field. His current research activities include the Oregon Prevalence Study on Child Abuse and Neglect Rates, an evaluation of stewards of children for child sexual abuse prevention, and an effort to reduce child abuse by 90% in one US county. Looking here, very much forward to hearing more from you. Thank you, uh, Jeff, for, for, for being um, with us. Thank you so much. I'd, I'd like to begin with Michaela. Firstly, congratulations and thank you for making such a powerful, superbly produced documentary series. I'd like to look at the timing and the intent of making this documentary now, so many years after the fact, and in a very different cultural climate. Tara Guber told us in introducing the episode about her motivation to make a documentary on incest. Perhaps you can tell us about the evolution and the very rigorous process for Alan V. Farrow, and what do you want this documentary to add? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I, I did come on um, after the documentary was in progress, but um, I think the timing was pretty key. I mean, I think that as you can see through the series that Dylan had tried to share her story multiple times um, and people weren't listening. Um, and so I think really after Me Too, it allowed a moment to have her voice heard in a very different way. Um, and, you know, like Tara said, I think that incest is an issue that has been missing from the conversation and hadn't been explored. And so while this is a story of, you know, celebrity and, and that gets you into it, 
at the end of the day, you know, it really is about this family and what the act of incest and does within that um, and how destructive it can be and, and how unique it is, I think, you know, that was a big, um, something that I, I didn't know as much about and I hadn't personally thought much about. And so um, I think it was a, an, an important way to get the topic out for discussion um, in a wider way through their, their story. And as you say, in so doing, there is so much covered in this documentary, even just in the episode that we watched tonight. Incest, of course, grooming, emotional abuse, parental alienation, celebrity power and privilege, institutional complicity, family court biases. They're all there. I would like to ask the whole panel, what jumps out for you and resonates most strongly um, as you've just watched this um, episode three of, of, of the documentary. Any of the panelists, please jump in. Uh, uh, what resonated with me was that this is such an unusual situation, such an excellent documentary, in that they were very high profile, they are very high profile people, but there were so many similarities to the cases that we see all the time from the the parent trying to get their child on video because they just have so many concerns about being believed um so much of the so many of the dynamics were very similar um this is just such an unusual opportunity to hear not only from the seven-year-old dylan but to hear from her as a young woman Thank you, Harriet. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, just hearing Dylan in her own words is what's really stunning. Um, the, the video that um, Mia Farrow did of her really doesn't have any of the signs of coaching or, um, or leading questions. And, and actually, I think what's ironic about uh, the case is um, the, the questions that Mia was asking are actually totally appropriate. And unless there was really extensive off-camera influence, um, Dylan's story is just so complete and so compelling and so poignant. And, and it's actually the investigations that followed that undermined the credibility of her report. And the sad thing is that in the 1990s, um, you know, there was mention of, of her uh, asked uh, questions with anatomical dolls. If you look at the social worker report, it's clear that he asked her questions, very narrow questions about, well, where did he touch you and how many times? And, and her story became flattened. It became inconsistent through repeated interviewing. Um, and, and what we've learned from cases like this is, you know, the best approach to take in child sexual abuse cases is as early as possible to do a, a state-of-the-art interview with the child to document the child's story. And it's only in, in those situations where, where children can be believed. I'd like to follow up more on that, but let's hear first from Jeff. Yeah, you know, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, this is painful. And, yeah. you know, that, that's a, a, a painful series of events that happened for Dylan, obviously, and it repeats itself over and over and over again throughout our country, and it continues to do so. And so I'm just feeling some connection to that pain uh, and some, actually a great deal of gratitude to Jane Doe Films. And if you look at their body of work, it's a kind of truth telling mm -hmm. that is a part of the solution. Uh, and so I feel gratitude for that too, and for that contribution to um, getting us out of the kind of denial minimization that continues to happen all the time. Uh, and so I, I think part of what I felt frustrated about, uh, and maybe we'll get in more detail around this in, in a bit, is that if you pull this back, and if it's if we make this not about Alan and Farrell for a moment, that it, the, the denial of minimization that happened in this story and is the most common response to disclosure of child abuse and neglect and other forms of childhood trauma. The most predictable response is denial of minimization. And so that happened again and again and again. And when it turns to an argument about something like parental alienation syndrome, it's, for me, it's the wrong conversation. It's, it's something very different than that. Uh, and maybe we'll get into those details in a moment, but I, just a few reflections. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, for, for those reflections. Um, you, you're all making it clear that although this is a high profile case, uh, it happens very often. And there are lots of similarities between what is going on all the time for so-called ordinary people. Can you tell us uh, something about the frequency of, of incest, which I understand is, is, is absolutely shocking? And um, what is the best way? to bring it out of the shadows. Any of you? Well, we, we know from, uh, and these are based on surveys where we have to rely on people being open and being willing to disclose abuse as, as children. But we know from surveys of adults that um, about one in four women uh, and about one in 20 men uh, in, in the United States uh, have suffered from contact sexual abuse. And so, you know, there's unwanted invasive touching when they were children. Um, and we also know that the, um, uh, that the likelihood that abuse occurs uh, within the family is, is very high. Um, and it's, um, uh, of course, you know, uh, reconstituted families present uh, especially high risk to children, but you also see it even in, in biological uh, uh, relationships as, you know, um, as we see often in, in court, uh, in dependency court where I work and, and we, we work with sexually abused children. Is there a correlation between interfamilial uh, sexual abuse and other forms of abuse in the family? Was there something quite separate? Maybe if I could take that just a bit with and maybe respond to both questions just briefly so because it's about the, the prevalence and the rates it's also about, about the response and so some work that we've done in oregon with with youth in our community um, something we call the prevalence study we went in and asked in, in a supported and connected and private way we asked high school juniors and seniors about abuse or neglect they might have experienced and, and similar to what tom was just saying in our community uh, 29% of high school juniors and seniors said that they had been sexually assaulted. And that was, and if you, if you look at other forms of abuse and neglect, the number gets higher. And we also asked and looked at those who had a sexual abuse history, did they have other forms of abuse in their lives? And in our, in our community, among our youth, about 90% who said they had been sexually assaulted had, all, had experienced other forms of trauma, uh, child abuse and neglect trauma. So the correlation, it happens so often. But just the other thing I'll say quickly is about response. So uh, among our youth here, and I think this is probably true throughout the United States, we asked, um, have you shared this with anyone at any time? And our youth, 47%, nearly half, said, as, as they're 17 and 18 years old, I haven't shared this with anyone at any time. And that, of course, is not an accident. And you asked about solutions. That's where some of the solutions are to change the norm that continues to perpetuate the silence for our kids. So, um, yeah. So making a documentary is part of the, is your, is your action to change the norm. Definitely, yeah. Um, Michaela, is that the expectation from this documentary? And are you seeing any evidence in its initial um, launch of making that impact? Yeah, I mean, I think the goal of documentaries in this space are certainly to spark conversation and dialogue. And I, I you know, just by being here, that's what's happening. And I think that, um, you know, Rain reported, I believe it was like a 20% increase. Um, I would have to double check that, but there was a large increase in the number of calls that they received um, the Monday after our screenings. Um, so that's a huge response as well. And that just means that some people are listening and, and, sitting with this information and acting upon it and whether that's reaching out for help, um, having those first conversations, speaking with people um, and whether it's not even survivors themselves, maybe it's someone else that's seeing, you know, behavior that little Dylan was, you know, we show in there, maybe other people are able to recognize that a little differently or look at it differently. And so um, I certainly think that there's been a big impact um, from that. And that's, that's always the goal with stories like this. We don't want to believe that this is going on. And I imagine that that's a large part of the almost universal reaction of denial and um, minimization that, that, you, that you mentioned. 
why would, why is that going to change? This is not a new phenomenon. This is as old as humanity itself. What what can what can realistically be done that would encourage people to 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 find their voice? That would um, somehow make it appropriate. I don't believe that anybody wants to harm a child necessarily when taking these depositions and these cases. And unfortunately, it, it, it seems that it, it often has misfired and we end up breaking up families or, or hurting the very ones that we, we love and want to help. It, it's complicated, it's messy. Can you, can you walk us through how the, the human brain processes these issues? And, and how we, in our threat avoidance, choose things that are not as wholesome or as healthy as they, they might be, make choices. One of the things that um, I was thinking about from a comment that Jeff made about the response that is going to have to change in order for more kids to feel safe telling. Right now, the systemic response, it's almost as if the default is to be disbelieving and skeptical and, and um, you know, children will often recant. They'll initially say what's happened and then the, res the systemic response is so chaotic and overwhelming and frightening, um, whether it's the breakup of the family or somebody that they really care about, the abuser um, having consequences, they'll recant, they'll take it back. And it's always so disappointing to me to see how readily the system believes the recant uh, and how skeptical they remain about the initial disclosure. Um, so I think as Jeff mentioned, the system's response, all of the system responses need to change. Would anyone like to embellish on that? I think that it's very clear that there needs to be change in, in many, many, many areas. I agree with what Harriet just said, for sure. Yeah, I, you know, I think the, the solutions are not a mystery that you, we can point to different communities who are making significant headway. And there's some evidence that, that sexual assault and domestic violence is on a decline, some credible evidence. So we're, it's not a mystery. And something like child sexual abuse and incense is, is largely preventable in my view. And, uh, but we have to, I think, go out of our way to make it very clear to our kids that we can have this conversation with you whenever you need to and whenever you're ready. And so if, it, you know, if it's hard to have a conversation about healthy, healthy sexuality, it's really difficult to have a conversation about sexual assault. And so conversations about healthy sexuality move us forward in being able to turn towards something like trauma. And, and so it, it, there are lots of places we can point to feel hopeful. Uh, and, and, and I'll give one example. The, in Oregon is where I am, so I'm more familiar. The Sexual Assault Task Force has been working for 20 years to change policy, to do much more prevention education. And our Senate just released a 20 year retrospective of that work. And it is a win for prevention. And they're working in, in important ways to change the norms that allow abuse and neglect to persist over time. So prevention, uh, there's, there's a lot of hopefulness in that work. It seems to me that, you know, the saying it takes a village, we all have a role to play when it comes to that, not just the professionals involved. Um, Perhaps you can speak to that. And, and Harriet, you're involved very much in, in, in education and prevention as well. Yes, um, the Rape Treatment Center, which is the umbrella organization over Stewart House, uh, has traditionally had a very robust prevention education program. Uh, at one point, we saw about 20,000 children, middle school kids, high school kids, every year um, where we went into the classrooms and presented a curriculum about sexual assault. And for, for middle schoolers, it was more um, just about um, respectful boundaries and, and that sort of thing. But 
all of our um, presenters were master's level mental health professionals because we realized very soon that so many disclosures came from the um, the program. So we would set aside time for kids to to come forward, but um, you know the the prevention education piece have been I've been really encouraged over the past 10 years or so to see that becoming much more vibrant. There's a lot of discussion about um, how to be a bystander, how to be you know meaningful practical actions that people can take when they see a situation uh, that seems unsafe. Um, but that's been more focused on peers, peer sexual assault. Um, so, um, I think the, the prevention work that we've done is more focused on, on kids. Um, and we do a lot of work with parents as well, just talking about ways to sort of inoculate their kids, um, by conversations they can have and just preparing them for different situations they might face. As they say, an ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of, of cure. We're getting a number of questions from our audience, and I encourage everyone to put the questions in the Q&A section. But when something hasn't been prevented, when it occurs, um, one of our, our viewers anonymously is, is, is asking you, uh, Professor Lyon, what can women do when they are so often not believed by judges? Um, she cites a figure of 80% of the, of the time losing custody battles when they bring up their ex-husband as the, as the abuser. Um, only 14 year olds apparently or older are allowed to talk to the judge in custody cases. But what do we do if we're not believed? The, the question for you, Professor Nain. Yeah, I've, I've seen uh, uh, similar statistics and the problem is that, um, is that women will often be advised by their attorneys in family court not to make allegations of uh, abuse, particularly sexual abuse, because the rate of skepticism is so high. And, and uh, the documentary mentioned the problem of parental alienation syndrome which, um, uh, I mean, there is alienation. Parents can do things to turn the other parent against their child, but it isn't something that only mothers do. But in court, it's something that is almost exclusively used as a weapon to undermine women's uh, concerns about their, um, their husband's behavior. Um, the irony is we do a much better job in, in criminal cases of sexual abuse than we do in family court. So as, as Harriet will tell you, um, in criminal cases, you know, we do a, a videotaped interview where we ask the child very open-ended questions and we document the report. And we can distinguish between true reports and coached reports on the basis of the completeness of what the child tells us. Just like you saw, you know, Dylan giving a very clear narrative that, that is, is very hard to imagine could be the product of coaching. In family court, we don't have anything like that. So custody evaluators do basically what you saw uh, the Yale program does, is they interview the child, um, but they aren't required to record, they aren't required to say verbatim what the child says, um, and that should change. Uh, the, the other thing is that, the, as the questioner mentions, um, judges tend to ignore the views of children. Um, now, it's actually a little bit younger than 14, I think it's about 12, where judges are required to consider whether children might have something to say. It should be considerably younger, um, because in my experience, um, even, even very young children can have can make reasonable statements about their preferences in custody cases, and, and they can be credible witnesses to abuse. So, right, we need to listen to children at a younger age, and we need to better document the reports that children make. Um. I'm, I'm struck by the testimony of, of, of children and by children. And I noticed on your uh, website, uh, Jeff, that you actually quote um, an Oregon child abuse preventative pre uh, uh, study uh, subject from high school. Um, what do children say? One of our viewers wants to know what's the prevalence of the responses from children who protect the abuser? What do children who are involved in these prevention programs or education programs, or with whom you have the opportunity professionally to, to engage an interview, what do they say about their, 
their choices and their position. Can you imagine the untenable situation that kids are in? You know, and so anything we can do to reduce that likelihood is a good thing. Um, well, the youth that we spoke with, there's a couple of things we'd be able to say briefly. Uh, the, 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 maybe the quote to the referring to was a, a youth saying to us, since we're giving you this information, we're asking about abuse and neglect they've experienced. Mm -hmm. They said, you better do something with it. Mm -hmm. So it was a call to action by our youth. And part of where we've gone with that is thinking that, you know, who are the messengers? And, and it's probably not me as an ideal messenger. And so we're now doing more and more work where we're working to engage youth voice and youth perspective. And we're asking them, what's your sense of how we might prevent something like child abuse and neglect? And when we turn to youth and ask them their perspective on those things, what they tell us is it's compelling and hard to dismiss. And, and so we're working hard to elevate youth voice and youth perspective and tap into their creativity as a driver to specific solutions. Can you tell us some examples of what they're telling you? Well, I mean, the primary thing that when we ask directly about abuse and neglect is the what I just mentioned just a bit ago. Do something about it. Do something. If we're sharing yeah. this with you, we expected a, a, some kind of a different result. So we're hearing that. The other thing that we're hearing from our, from our youth is that they are, they, they are glad that they're being asked. And there was some anxiety about, would it be okay to ask youth about trauma that they've experienced? And would that hurt, harm them in some way? Not asking is harmful and minimizing is harmful. So they're, they're telling us, we're glad you're asking and we wanna be involved in the solution. Ken, I want to go back to you. You had a tremendous amount of contact with Dylan throughout this entire process, and it's very unique that we have her recorded as a child at the time, and now her perspective as a as a grown woman and and, her, and a mother um, herself. Um, she constantly questions herself and doubts whether she did the right thing and whether she was strong enough or courageous um, enough. But there's the whole aspect of who is spinning this narrative and how does the media play into all of this? And we cannot ignore the influence of power and privilege in, in, in really being able to, um, to skew whatever narrative is being told. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about um, uncovering all of the complexity of that angle? Sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, as with me too, I think we've now seen these stories over and over again and how people weren't believed. I mean, from Bill Cosby to Harvey Weinstein, I think it's more clear now at how those narratives have been spun over time. And so um, to look at the story now in this lens and to be able to understand what information was actually out there and to see how he was able to spin it and how the media ran really with whatever he was willing to, to divert with. Um, I think it just became really clear um, now in the lens that we're in today to be able to look back through that. Um, and it, it really was, I mean, you can, you can see that other stories were out there and the ones that really gained prominence and the ones that people know are generally his side of the story. And so I think even though she, she did try to speak up multiple times um, it felt like his story always went out. Um, and so I think that's really a part of why the series was so important for us and for us to really center and always ground Dylan. Mm -hmm. You know, episode three is probably the episode she's in the least um, a bit. And so it was always really important to find those really grounded moments with her, um, you know, especially when she talks about incest and those complicated emotions of what it is to have it be a father and someone you loved and you trusted and, and to make sure that those moments were really, we always went back to Dylan for them um, because at the end of the day, that's what was most important um, with, with sharing the story uh, was to finally be able to give her her voice throughout it. Um, We've, we've talked a little bit about prevention. Let, let's look at intervention um, if, if we can. And we're actually getting some questions from viewers who are in a terrible situation and are desperately asking for some guidance. Um, 
when others are not believing them, uh, including the, the lawyers and the court and, and others. What, what, are the, what is the advice that you can give for those who are in this situation, whether it's a parent or a victim? Um, where, is, where do we go for, for the right kind of intervention? And what's the right way to ask for it? I'm happy to make a comment unless someone else wants to. Yeah. And do you mind, do you mind just repeating the question? In a nutshell, um, when, when somebody is in a terrible situation and desperate for help and just does not know how to go about it, here is, 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 is a, a mother basically who's trying to protect her, her, her children, feels that nobody is listening to her. Um, what can she do? Where can she go? Uh, the lawyers themselves are making uh, inappropriate remarks. Um, and as soon as, you know, she reports who she feels is the, the offender, uh, he retaliates towards her. And she's basically just, what, what should I do? How, how, how does somebody in a desperate situation go about finding the right way and the right place to turn for help? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's hard. That's a hard one. It sounds like this, this individual has tried many, many, many things. And, and, and so I, I think, you know, it, it's, I don't have the answer to that question. I have a hope that that, that individual, as they move through this, this process where they're finding some like many dead ends, that they it, it, at least have a person or two that they can turn to and feel some connection around. Because it it can be a, obviously a crazy making situation, and so is there one or two people um, they can connect with? And in our community, we have an organization called the Trauma Healing Project that you can t turn to in very specific situations like this, and that's more available, you know, via telehealth and in no in a very low cost. So, yeah, I'd be happy to talk with that individual. Um, yeah, if they would want to contact me and we could strategize just at the individual level, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Jeff, very much. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the individual has, has, has taken note. Um, we learned um, actually from Tara at the beginning of the program about My Voice Matters and a Voice in Action initiative um, that is actually bringing all of your various institutions together, USC, UCLA, University of Oregon. Um, is, is this an initiative that the general public can be aware of? Is this something that is likely to be in, to invite in the wide participation of the broad public? Can anyone speak to, to that? Or other initiatives that you'd like to make us aware of? Uh, well, one of the leaders of the first initiative that you mentioned uh, in a conversation said she'd like it to get really big. And so I'd be in full support of that, getting very big. So there's that. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Let me move on to some other questions from our audience. Uh, there is a question about the statistics for predictors of child abuse based on abuse of the mother. Can anyone address that? And I'd also like to follow up on that. Very often we hear that those who are abused turn out to be abusers when they grow up as well. And, and can you address that in breaking this, this, this cycle that we're trying to, to intercede in? I can speak to the, the second part of that, the idea of the child who's abused growing up to become an abuser. If we're talking about sexual abuse, um, that's something that has not really been supported by research. Uh, and it makes sense if you think about the disproportionate number of girls who are sexually abused and the fairly rare occurrence of having a female adult sexual abuser. Um, one thing that is correlated with um, somebody who grows up to become a sexual abuser of children is physical abuse um, in their childhood. And the thinking is that might disrupt their ability to develop empathy, um, 
but uh, I, I do welcome the opportunity to just sort of um, push back a little bit on the idea that uh, kids who are abused are going to grow up to become abusers. That's just not um, borne out by research, as I said. Good, good. I just want to, if I could highlight that briefly too, that uh, in, in full agreement with that statement, that the, the more likely outcome is that a survivor will harm themselves over time. And, and that's largely because if like Dylan, you have to live alone with it uh, and, and, and you're not sharing it with others because you get messages that you can't, much more likely to harm ourselves than someone else. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to you, Tom. There's a question here. How can we help shift the culture of the court that dismisses abuse? We've talked about trying to educate the public and, and educate ourselves, but what about the education of the courts? And you, you had started to, to touch on that earlier. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a generational thing. So fortunately, a lot of the judges with the most bigoted attitudes are aging out. And, um, and as we see more, uh, uh, particularly women uh, entering the legal profession and, and finding uh, work with children as a specialty, um, I think we're going to see a change in attitudes. Um, it, it's not a coincidence. If you, if you look at some of the family law judges who have the most uh, progressive attitudes in terms of listening to children and um, and at least giving you know uh, people a fair shake in terms of their allegations, uh, they tend to be women, um, and so you know that's that's one pretty simple solution. Um, another thing we can do is 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 educate judges, and so um, there there are California actually does have mandates for family law judges to undergo training in understanding family violence. And, um, and of course they treat it like, oh God, I gotta go to another training. But, um, but I think that is a way that we can reach at least some of the younger, uh, more open-minded judges um, to, to, to give more credence to, to allegations when, when they are true. At the same time though, you know, we wanna be careful because um, fathers, uh, you know, this isn't just a situation where women are being tortured in family court. Fathers make false allegations all the time in family court. And so, you know, we do have to be careful about saying well, anytime anyone says the other spouse is an abuser, it's true. Fathers abuse the system probably more than women. And so again, we have to do a better job of how we document these, uh, these allegations when they come up. How difficult is, to, is it to actually discern the truth? It, it can be extremely difficult. Um, you know, in, in the vast majority of cases where children allege uh, sexual abuse, um, there, there will not be a criminal case. And the reason for that is because uh, district attorneys want to see corroboration. And there rarely is any physical evidence, little medical evidence. Of course, perpetrators don't abuse children in front of others, and so there's rarely eyewitnesses. Um, and uh, perpetrators, at least if they're you know a reasonable intelligence, they don't confess. And so, so these cases are extremely difficult uh, to prove. Um, but again, you know what what we've learned is children are the best witnesses to their own experiences, and and so um, so what we have to be able to do is to do a good enough job of talking to and interviewing children so that the child can be the primary witness. Um, and it's only if we do that can we start to believe allegations where you know, there isn't going to be uh, DNA um, or, or other kinds of, uh, uh, you know, there's not gonna be a smoking gun. Michaela, you and your team have poured through, I don't know how many, thousands and thousands of documents and video footage and news coverage um, and, and articles. Um, I, I don't know what, what struck you most particularly in, in this, um, in this in investigation. It is an investigative um, report. And how did you make the decisions to edit it down the way you did into a very tight and compelling four-part presentation? Yeah, I mean, the I think 
taking it kind of piece by piece really helped. I think, um, you know, having this episode really be the investigation allowed us to drill in pretty methodically and allowed us to have a little bit more space in other episodes to have a little bit more of the family emotion and the relationships. And, you know, this episode is also on its own very different. We have, um, you know, Amy narrates it because it is so complicated. There's multiple investigations. It's hard to keep track of. Um, and so having narration in this episode really just helped to lay it out more clearly. Um, and yeah, I mean, for us, it was a lot of work. It was a large team of people going through documents and a lot of discussions about um, you know, what was important. It also mattered who, um, who was gonna speak with us um, and who, who could back the, you know, everything up um, and what we could actually show. So there were a lot of conversations um, and you know, we were able to take our time with this. It, it took us two years to make the series, um, to edit the series actually, more to actually make it. And so I think being given that time allowed us to make sure we were being really thoughtful about the information we were putting forward, have those discussions, make sure that we were doing it um, you know, ethically and in the right ways in order to present this information in an impactful way um, that would resonate with audiences, mm -hmm. but was, you know, we knew it was factually tight and that we could present it without any issues mm -hmm. as well, so. There's always an, a desire to be fair and balanced. Um, was this the intent here or, or did you begin to form a very, very strong goal of the message that you wanted to convey uh, in, this, in this documentary? Yeah, I mean, I think we, everyone what goes went in open, but also knowing that we were going in um, with Dylan and her voice, uh, this was, you know, her chance to tell her story. Um, but at the same time, we looked at all of the evidence and everything that was there um, and wanted to make sure that we were putting everything forward in, a, in the right way, um, in a journalistic way. And, um, you know, I think that, we didn't believe he would speak with us, but I think that a lot of what we put in there in terms of his book and his appearances and were a lot of, you know, his messaging. Um, and so I think it was important to kind of have those to represent um, his side and how he told his side of the story and has told it, you know, for the past 20, 30 years. Um, but ultimately, you know, we, we were going in to allow Dylan to speak for herself and, and we need that. Thank you, Michaela. There's, speaking of children speaking for themselves, we, we have a question and it's really an ask, a request for some clarification. The question from our viewer is, are you saying that it is typical for children to self-disclose abuse? I thought, says the viewer, that it was very much the opposite. Can some, anyone please clarify that? That, that's right. That's right. Most most children <clears throat> most children will will not disclose during their childhood. Um, the point is is that when a child does disclose, that tends to be the only evidence. And so you know the, when there's rare opportunities to intervene on behalf of a child who does disclose, we have to act aggressively because of the fact that that most children suffer in silence. Another thing that's important to understand, and this was sort of um, referenced in the documentary, I think it was in the writing of one of the evaluators, I think uh, Jennifer Sawyer, maybe it was, said um, in her communications with um, someone else that she believed that there was probably more to tell. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, as Tom said, most kids don't disclose as children, but those who do, will often just tell a little bit, um, sort of dipping their toe in the water to gauge the reaction of people. And so we really refer to the disclosure process as something that unfolds over time. Uh, it's not um, you know, a one-time recounting of everything that's happened. That's very, very unusual. Thank you. Um, back to another question, and that is whether it's important to pursue a criminal prosecution on the back of the exposure from this series for closure for Dylan, for hope for other survivors, and as a deterrent for offenders. Uh, what are your thoughts? And is there a likelihood of this, or are 
statutes of limitations expired or, or other legal impediments. Is there likely to be a, a, a felony lawsuit? And is it necessary or important? I, I, Who would benefit? Yeah, I don't know about the, <clears throat> whether it's a wise idea, but it, it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the sad thing about the allegations in this case are that they were, um, they were pretty much tainted by poor investigation the repeated interviewing, um, it would make it extremely difficult to prove this case in a, in a criminal court. Thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit about resilience? We hear Dylan blame herself and there's a great deal of self-loathing and, and a feeling that I must have done something wrong um, or I'm, I'm ashamed of what happened to me or somehow I'm, I'm the bad person. How does one help the, the victim of such abuse, especially a child, uh, find that resilience and, and really heal and know that it's not your fault and you can go on to, to, to lead a wonderful life and very full uh, and giving um, as a giving person? I'll just say from working with some survivors um, with Dylan and, and others. I think the biggest thing that I've heard from speaking with people is, is listening and, and being heard, um, I think goes a long way. And I think that that's certainly one thing that it, people I've spoken with um, struggle with the most. And, and that helps in the, in the healing journey, certainly. Yes, I think, um... Professional therapy is is very helpful. We've learned so much in the past 15 years about what works well. And it's absolutely true that um, this doesn't, a, a sexual abuse experience in childhood does not have to um, ruin one's life. And in, in there really is real healing that, that can happen. Um, I think that that's one of the most important things that we can let people know. Um, it also occurred to me when the listener was asking about what to do in a desperate situation when the lawyers won't listen, the court won't listen. You know, it doesn't feel very good to say this, but I think sometimes um, when you can't seem to seek justice through the criminal justice system and perhaps even family court isn't um, isn't finding justice for you. It's important to know that that therapy, professional therapy really really does help. And I think that you know sometimes with our families, one of the things that we're the most intent about is making sure that they get connected with um, excellent services either here at Stewart House or somewhere else um, because that is going to um, really change someone's life and enhance their resilience. Thank you. Good note perhaps for us to conclude. Let me give each of you just one opportunity um, to address the, the single most important thing that you think that all of us um, can do uh, to make a difference, and, um, and and what would be your highest priority at this point? You, you've all talked about the wonderful programs that you're engaged in, the things you'd like to see happen. Leave us with one, one parting word of empowerment of something that we can do, or some resources to which we can turn. I, I think if, if we turn toward the issue, like happened with this with the documentary and with Alan versus Pharaoh, that's an example of the thing we can do. The, 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 the easiest thing to do is to turn away. And so if we can turn toward and hold our attention there, that'll, that starts to change uh, the culture of this work. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I, I think we need to, we need to learn to speak with less embarrassment and less shame 
when we talk to our children about sexual matters. Because the, the sad thing is, is children grow up embarrassed about their bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely that that abusers take advantage of in ensuring that they don't disclose. And so, you know, early on in school, we should be teaching children about their bodies. Pediatricians should ask children about touching in the home and abuse in the home. Um, only if we overcome that, the shame that everyone feels about this issue um, will we encourage children to be frank about their experiences. And I, and I think it's only then when we can really start to prevent sexual abuse. Thank you very much, Tom. Harriet, do you want to add some thoughts of your own? Yes, actually, I was going to say something similar to what Tom said, uh, but I would also like to just offer the, the phone number for the Rape Treatment Center in Stewart House for anybody who is interested in seeking help um, that I can just say it or I can put it in the chat. It's do best. It's do best. Okay. So the, the number <clears throat> is 424-259-7208. Um, and I'll add that to the the chat as well. Thank you. Michele, let's give you the last word. You you clearly had some important goals and intentions for making this documentary. Are you seeing evidence that it is starting to have an impact? And what would be your wish going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there has been an impact. Um, I think the more, you know, conversations that happen like this and you know the people from here go and have other conversations I think it, it does grow um, and that that's certainly been the goal and that's you know continues to be the goal and so you know um, certainly if, if there are people you, you know to share the documentary with or and to continue these conversations um, and I know that the impact team has been doing a lot of incredible work around this. And I think engaging people, you know, like these incredible panelists who are really in it and know it, I think is, um, has been an incredible journey for, for the project. So Wonderful. And do remind viewers that the entire series is available on HBO and we do encourage you to watch it all, expose others to it and discuss it, talk about it. I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists. You are each making a significant difference in your professional capacities, and you inspire each of us to personally do likewise in whatever ways we can. And thank you for outlining some of those first steps that we can all take. Thank you to our audience for your participation. Please join us again soon for more special programs of the Museum of Tolerance, either in person, some of them are in the Pelt Theatre, and also on virtual uh, platforms. Thank you all. We wish you a good night.